yes, it'll glow red. If it's red, that means you're wrong. And when you finish the TV... Okay, uh, everybody uh, sitting comfortably? Thank you. Uh, before I start the meeting, I uh, hope everybody's had a um, good Christmas and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, but before we start the planning committee, as I always remind people, uh, and this is to everyone present, that this meeting will be broadcast live via the internet and the record is archived for future viewing. So with that being said, um, also kind of bring to your attention a, a email that was sent out to all members yesterday. It's in connection with late representations from Rona Probert. Uh, probably in the uh, late reps, there's only a mention of some of the things she said. But uh, I want to bring your attention to that email. Has everybody received it? Everybody read it and happy? Okay, thank you. Uh, can we move on then to apologies for absence? Uh, I know there are a number of members who are absent tonight. Uh, Liz Burnett has sent her apologies. I know Anthony Powell sent his, and so has Margaret Wilkinson. Um, any others? Otherwise, I think we're everybody here, aren't we? Yeah, okay then. Uh, minutes of the last meeting, can I sign them off as a true record? Thank you. Uh, to receive declarations of interest under the Council's Code of Conduct. Uh, Councillor Hodges first. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> agenda item 9, 2016-002194, United Reformed Church, Windsor O'Barry. Uh, as before, I am a very near neighbour and local resident who is directly affected, so I will withdraw. Lovely, thank you. And Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. It's not exactly a declaration of interest, but I'm a member of Panar Town Council who considered the application for uh, Northcliffe. Uh, I said at that time, and I'll repeat now, I uh, will treat the matter with a fresh mind, taking account of the officer's views, the officer's report, and anything else that's added to it tonight. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, so, Councillor Birch and Councillor Williams. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so, we'll move on to Agenda Item 4, which is Site Inspections, uh, a report from the Managing Director. Is there anything to add, Marcus? Nothing to add, Chairman. Thank you. Agenda Item 5, Building Regulation Applications, other than Building Control Matters, determined by the Head of Regeneration and Planning under his delegated powers. You'll find that on page 1. Anything to add, Marcus? Nothing to add, Chairman. There we are. Nothing to add. Members, move we note. Thank you. Six, planning applications determined by the Head of Regeneration and Planning under his delegated powers, which is found on page eight. Anything to add, Marcus? Nothing to add, Chairman. Move we note. Okay, thank you. Uh, seven, appeals, which is found on page 18. Anything to add, Marcus? No, nothing to add, Chairman. Move we note. <coughs> okay, thank you. Eight, which is trees and the little eye under the delegated list, which is on page 21. Anything to add, Marcus? No, there you are. Move we note. Yeah. Thank you. So we're into planning applications for real. Uh, the first one on the agenda is on page 23, which is Northcliffe Lodge, Northcliffe Drive, Penarth, which was subject to a site visit this morning, an extensive site visit. We went uh, all over the site. And um, it's subject to late representations, if you've got your late reps 
in front of you, and I'll ask uh, Marcus Goldsworthy, our Head of uh, Regeneration and Planning, to go through the report. Marcus. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just to note, there are uh, five separate items of late representation. I won't run through each one individually, but if members note those late letters, of, uh, letters and various items of uh, uh, late items to that report. Um, this report is for uh, an application to demolish an existing dwelling uh, and to construct 30 apartments in three principal apartment blocks, um, 23 two-bedroom and seven three-bedroom duplex units on the site of North Cliff House. Um, the uh, scheme is shown in some detail on page 25 of the report with a, with a section through the site. Um, and again, on page 26, you will see the layout of the various blocks that are proposed as part of the development. The development does include a new access to the site, um, which goes around the outside of an existing flatted development and an existing car park to, an, to an, a neighbouring flatted development. Um, as part of the proposal, um, car parking is proposed. Um, members will note that it is on a very sloping site. Uh, met those members that were on site visits today will have um, gone right onto the site and had a look and noted um, the conditions there. Um, it is set on the headland and um, is above the former, um, former marine buildings and the, um, uh, the restaurant that is now there down on the, um, uh, the side of the marina. Um, Ready to take any questions? After. Okay. Um, anybody want to raise any questions at this point? No? Okay. Councillor Roberts. This is my first and only experience as a county councillor. It's been a great learning curve from the start, but since I joined planning, is <laughs> I realise just how steep a learning curve that is. And um, so it's so much going on is that everybody believes that their development is in the wrong place, that it should be somewhere else. And I've now seen uh, sort of how planning officers, uh, probably the most criticised local government officers maybe other than refuse collectors, my admiration has grown for them because it's, it's, the most in, uh, it's the most difficult thing to judge where you're judging for and against so many different things and having to balance them. And I also find that planning reports the most interesting to read because uh, you never quite know which way the recommendation is going to go. It's a bit like the denouement of a good novel. Um, but when I read this one, I certainly would have got it wrong because I was shocked to see it was recommended for approval. My first concern is for the marine buildings at the end of the barrage, as well as the overall landscape of Penarth Head. Um, because it was built on coal, there are very few precious buildings uh, in Penarth. Uh, that reflect uh, both the history and the existence of Penarth. This is one of two buildings. Um, alongside it is the Custom House restaurant, uh, which shows how beautiful and viable a good restaurant is. a problem. Is it a problem, Chair? Just hang on a second. Oh, right. Sorry about that. We've got public speakers. I forgot about that. So, oh, uh, if we, moment. <laughs> yeah, if uh, I've got uh, a number of people who want to speak, I know the first one is Miss Miss Anne Greasby. Are you here? Yeah. Would you like to go and sit up in the chair? Uh, another one against is Mr. Lawrence Bright Blight. Sorry, sorry, that's the on there. Yeah. So, is there anybody else against, or just you? Yeah, oh, right, thank you. How long should that take? Two, two, three, three. You've got three minutes, and the time will start when you're ready. Okay. 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 New development must have full regard to the context of the local natural and built environment and its special features. I want to talk about the detrimental impact of this development. This will damage the setting and local character of the Custom House and the view from the barrage, which is part of the coastal wall. This is Penarth's iconic headland. First thing you see is the Custom House framed by trees, but if this goes ahead, it will look like a series of modernist boscas, totally out of keeping with Victorian Penarth. 
A few saplings will not mitigate the cost of the loss of 40 mature trees. The green corridor along the cliff top will be trashed. Deleting TPO protection without not even a regret is shocking to me and naturalists and bird lovers, and it extends the veil war on trees. There may not be protected species in numbers here, but the rich biodiversity on this piece of land will be lost forever. There are foxes, squirrels, birds, bats, plants, and who knows what else, another habitat gone forever. Secondly, there's just 30 parking places for 30 flats, and that's well below standards. The adjacent Mariner Heights recently built had to provide one car space per bedroom as the current standard, and that makes 65. The reason given? Although not far from the town centre, as the crow flies, this area has some of the steepest hills in Panar. There aren't even any drop curves and difficult uneven pavements that would prevent even the hardiest souls from making it to the town centre and back with shopping, never mind the frail or the disabled or a parent with a pram. The scheme, this, this scheme is a danger for pedestrians. Even the road through the estate is supposed to be unadopted which means no standard pavements. This is an accident waiting to happen. The officers say the extra cars can park in Padgett Place where parked cars already stop buses from pulling in. They have no evidence in spare places. There are none spare. The new entrance drive would even remove several, causing worse overcrowding. The report says excellent bus service is quite wrong. The 89 bus doesn't meet the Vale 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. sustainable standard as it starts at 8.30 and finishes at 6. The bus doesn't run Sundays or bank holidays, not Sunday or Monday this New Year week. They're often late because of congestion in Cardiff. That level of service doesn't justify a reduction in parking standards. Trees to be chopped down a low access to allow it will rob those in Padgett Place of their privacy. It will disrupt the whole character of the street. This is the edge of our conservation area. The modern Northcliffe flats were permitted on the proviso of retaining the mature trees screening alongside Padgett Place. Today, we're more conscious of the need to retain our heritage and the need to enhance the local character and settings of new developments. The Penarth Conservation Area document says, new developments around Penarth Head need to maintain and enhance. The planning report gives no regard to this policy. High risk of landslide, say the consultants and the Vale engineers. Mr Goldsworthy told the site meeting the Welsh up? policy on unstable land is only for pit heaps in the valleys. He's wrong. Yeah. The Wales planning policy clearly applies yeah. can here you, too. Can you stop now? The planning committee have therefore to consider the hazards to nearby okay. properties of such landslides. Thank you. This is a lose-lose for Penarth, a lose for those who need affordable housing, yeah. can you stop? a lose for those who need trees or green corridors. Sorry. We lose our iconic headlands. Uh, I'm sorry, rocks, you can't and carry we might on. Lose the cliff altogether. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she turned off. Did you want to say something, Councillor Hartree? Uh, well, it, they, have they been registered? We don't know. Uh, we've no documentation to say they've registered. Okay. Uh, okay, we've got a speaker for. Uh, that's Mr. Sam Courtney. If you'd like to come up and take your place, thank you. Uh, yes, before we ought to, yeah. Uh, yeah, points of clarification, if uh, if you don't mind. Has she left? Where Where are you? Oh, sorry. Yeah, would you like to um, s stay seated and uh, the committee may ask you some points of clarification? Okay. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Chair. ask about um, the, uh, your, your point about the impact on the surrounding areas. Can you, can you elaborate or can you clarify rather uh, how you think this is going to impact on the street scene and the, uh, the, the custom house building and the harbour building which are yeah, below? Councillor Franks, it's uh, um, a not a, a point of clarification. You're asking uh, as a, a, a witness to say what her opinion is. Uh, I'm going to rule that out of order. It's not right. Uh, you can ask for any point of clarification from what she's actually said, not lead her into other subjects. 
Okay, thank you for that guidance. Um, can I? Uh, can you clarify why you think this will have an adverse impact on the surrounding area? Yeah, it is the same question, just put in a different way. Um, I'll let her answer this one point. Okay. He's asking you what impact you think it's going to have on the surrounding area. I live in this area, and I live very close to this site. And it, there, there, LDP has already um, indicated that they want to chop down a number of trees and headlands and build on that on that part of land. And this particular site is a lot of green. It's got a lot of trees, and this has never been built on. And if this area is loses all that green space and the green trees and the biodiversity, the whole character of the neighbourhood, which is adjoining conservation area, and as I said, the trees there were kept when Northcliff, the other flats were built, to mitigate the damage to the conservation area and to that particular row of houses. Penarth, as you know, is a Victorian seaside town. But when you're going to be looking at the barrage, when you come over from the barrage, now you're going to be looking up and you'll see the custom house, which is a listed building. And it's going to be framed, instead of being framed by leafy trees, it's going to be framed by flats mm. with flat roofs and garden. And all. I mean, it's completely going to change the whole okay. character. It will just look like we're an extension of Cardiff Yeah, Bay. yeah. Uh, okay, you've answered the point. Is there any other member who wants to ask a point of clarification? Okay, thank you for that. Um, can I ask now Mr. Sam Courtney to come forward, who wants to speak for the department? You can take your seat now, um, Mrs. Greasby. Thank you. You've got three minutes, and uh, your time starts when you start speaking. Okay, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I act on behalf of the applicant, Celtic Development Plant Penarth Limited, in respect to this application for 30 apartments to replace the ex existing detached Northcliff Lodge Penarth. Members have before them a detailed report which sets out all the relevant planning considerations, providing a comprehensive and balanced appraisal of the main issues. It is therefore not considered necessary to repeat all of the main arguments which are suitably addressed within the report. Instead, <coughs> I only wish to draw members' attention to a few key matters which I hope will will aid your positive consideration of the application. The applicant has given very careful consideration to the design approach of the scheme, given the site's unique opportunities and constraints, given the elevated position, topography, and proximity to adjacent heritage assets. A split-level apartment design has been adopted by the architects Loin & Co, and is considered to be an appropriate design solution, which nestles the development <coughs> into the plateaus of the headland landscape. The bespoke contemporary design, which will be framed by retained trees together with new tree planting, is sought not to compete with the historic fabric nearby, but will add interest to the views of the site from across the bay. All required ecological surveys have been completed. Both NRW and the Council's ecologists raised no objection, subject to the implementation of the submitted biodiversity strategy. It is recognised that some of the trees within the site are protected. A tree survey has, however, revealed that many of these trees which are to be removed are either of poor condition and are recommended for removal or of lower quality. This matter will have been observed at the site meeting earlier today. A comprehensive landscaping scheme has accordingly been prepared, which the development, <coughs> which the development will provide mitigatory trees planting to the satisfaction of the council's tree officer, who raises no objection. I would like to draw members' attention to the fact that no objections are raised to this proposal, proposal from any of the internal or external specialist consultees. Objections have been raised during the appraisal process and the application has taken these very seriously, providing further information and making amendments to address all reasonable planning issues. To close, I'd like to reassure members that this application, as revised, has been properly considered and has subsequently received your officer's recommendation, uh, your officer's support, following a detailed propose, uh, process of consultation and negotiation, taking on board a variety of matters which have been raised during the process. In light of the above, I would respectfully request that members support your officer's recommendation for approval of the development, 
which represents an efficient reuse of land which fully accords with principles of sustainable development, as advocated by both national guidance together with policies of the development plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Uh, any points of clarification? Councillor Hodges. So, thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for that. Um, on page 42 of the report, it goes on about ground stability and drainage. And it says, uh, bottom paragraph, the application is supported by a slope stability desktop study prepared by Terra Firma, which concludes the site is at high risk of subsidence related to landslides. Um, it then goes on to say about works will be undertaken and Friends of the Earth suggest that no consent should be granted before works are undertaken. And that's unreasonable in planning terms. My, my question really is that if you get the planning permission, um, I assume you would be going ahead with the demolition of the existing house mm. and the various tree removal works and ground preparation. Um, what if then on preparation of the site that you discovered that there are major landslide problems, what happens then? Well, I believe further to the original report, which was pre prepared by Terra Firma, further um, borehole testing was undertaken. A full site investigation hasn't, however, been completed because of the, um, the existence of the trees, the limitation of getting access and getting a rig to site. Um, but some testing has been carried out, which has given, given comfort to uh, our, our geotechnical engineers that the site can be developed. There is further, a th uh, for further more detailed investigation work to be undertaken which can only be undertaken when the, um, when the building has been demolished um, and, and, and an access been, been um, uh, uh, obtained. What this further investigation will, 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 will do, will, it will help to um, uh, I, uh, give intelligence to the design. And we know that the, the design is going to be a, um, uh, a piled solution, but it will give intelligence in terms of the depth of those solutions and, 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 the, and the detailed ca calculations uh, uh, w which is the, the, the technical information which will you'll normally follow. Okay. Yes, okay. This is a full planning application, and I, I'm surprised that we're having this without knowing the depth of the piling and how it works and, uh, and how the scheme would progress. Um, what sort of depth do you anticipate that the piles might be? We expect the, the pass to be seven metres. Okay. You want to ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Councillor Roberts. You just you just referred to the um, stability and some investigation take place. Are you co are you aware of um, TAN fourteen technical advice note number fourteen in respect of coastal developments? Okay. Well, in that case, if I quote from page seven of that, where there are eroding cliffs or potentially unstable slopes, and the desktop study says specifically is an actively unstable one. The development control says, a site reconnaissance study will need to be followed by detailed site investigation, including a risk assessment and or environmental study prior to lodging a planning application. The way I read that, this application appears to be very premature. Could you clarify what your thoughts are on that, please? No, I, I, I don't agree. Um, I, as I say, that there was an initial um, desktop study that was undertaken, but that's been supplemented with um, uh, uh, further on-site works, coupled with the works that Terra Firma have undertaken on, on adjacent sites. And it's with all that information that they're, 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 uh, they're um, highly confident that they've got a design solution for the scheme. Um, it's, it's, it's more about further un uh, understanding the site once the building has been demolished and providing the, 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 the more detailed technical input, which, as I say, is an normally um, undertaken outside of the planning process. In a nutshell, then, what you've just described is what you would call a detailed site investigation, including a risk assessment and or environmental study. You believe that to be the case, do you? I believe that officers have recommended conditions um, which the applicant's happy to adhere to and our, our, our geotechnical engineers are happy to adhere to. That was my question, Chair. Yeah. Did you have a question, Peter King? No? John Drysdale. Thank you, Chair. You have touched on the design of the building. It's very, very difficult to see from the report or even from the, the picture on the, the slide. 
what it's going to look like, but the, the diagrams in the report look pretty stark and boxy. You said that, yes, it's a modern solution that will complement the architecture uh, surrounding it, particularly the listed buildings. Can you tell me what principles and thinking there were that reached that design that says this is complementary to the existing uh, listed building? I think it was mentioned at the site um, meeting today that um, the approach was, was not to try and um, not to try and and to take a pastiche of the, the Victorian architecture which surrounds the site and not to try and dilute any of the historic fabric. And so it was to, to, to take a fresh approach with a contemporary design. And so that's, that's pretty much the driving philosophy. The site constraints themselves uh, lead the design. And, and as you'll have seen, um, those that attended the site vis visit, we've looked to utilise the plateaus, the three main plateaus, with the, with the development um, falling down, down the, um, the, the, the levels as, as you've progress through the site so in in short it was it was just not to um not to try and um uh, replicate the historic buildings but provide something that was distinct from it okay councillor franks thank you chair um you say that the scheme uh, will improve the um uh, the view from the barrage direction um i'm struggling to understand that i'll, I'll be honest with you um, I, I, following the site visit, I went to the barrage and had a look up, and I do find it difficult from this plan to see how it will be improved. So, for clarity's sake, um, can you say why you think the development will be an attractive addition when viewed from the barrage, especially as the report says that the, the development will be overtly contemporary so to me that clashes with the victorian facade of the um, custom house and the harbour masters buildings i'm 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 representing the applicant here but i'm also a resident of panath and i, I know, know the area very well i i believe it is a contemporary design which will you know which which will stand out from the um uh, for, from, from the historic building. I don't think it's going uh, it's going to detract from the building, but it'll complement it. I think there is a contemporary design and um, it, it, it is by a, a renowned architect uh, and that in itself isn't, isn't, isn't justification for the design, but it's been well considered um, it, 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 it responds well to the context and I, and, and I firmly believe that it, it will be an asset. Okay. Andrew Parker. Yes, I took advantage to go and have a look from the barrage this morning, uh, and I've been trying to reconcile, and I still can't work out. The existing old building there would have, I'm trying to work out the roof height of the existing building relative to the highest point on the thing, and I'm looking at um, the architect's view, which is actually t obviously from the barrage, is there any way you can actually tell me whether the roof level and the house level are similar, higher or lower? Or, and that might be a question, if not, for one of the officers. Sorry, I don't have the full set of plans for me. I'm, I'm not sure whether you're asking in relation to the existing house or in relation to the custom house. Uh, can you just turn your uh, mic... If, if, if you're, if, if you're in, in the car park of the barrage, if you look across, you can actually see the right-hand side of the existing building. And I've been trying to relate the ridge level, or the, the roof levels, because it's flat roofs, to the topmost point of that, which would then give me an understanding of how much effect it would have on the two historic buildings uh, in the docks. There, there's a section. There's a section through the site in in the report. But in, a, in a, to answer your question, I think there may be a drawing that the officers may have, but I don't have it to hand. So maybe when um, officers can co come back with you um, on that during the um, during during their dis further discussion. Okay. Any other member? Okay. Would you like to take a seat back in the auditorium? Um, it's up to officers now to uh, respond to. The uh, 
speakers. Thank you, Chair. If I deal with that first point, um, it would have been extremely useful to have that question before us, before the meeting. We, we don't actually have immediate access to the plans. If you look at the booklet Vicky is trying to look through now, um, it makes up about 50 pages. So I can't answer that question, I'm afraid, um, unless we do come across the plan in the, in the meantime. Um, in terms of a couple of other issues, um, the car parking obviously is dealt with it within the report quite clearly. Um, the spaces that are proposed um, are considered acceptable. Highway colleagues have looked at it, looked at this development, and have, have, um, in some depth in terms, in terms of both the access to the site and in terms of the parking provision, and consider what is proposed is adequate. Um, again, turning to the issue of ecology, that has been looked at in some depth, and um, there are no objections to the scheme. Um, finally, in respect of the trees um, and the loss of trees as part of the development, um, it is important to note that a number of the trees that are protected by uh, the tree preservation orders actually um, would not, if an application were made to remove them solely without a new development, in, development being proposed, they would be um, of a standard that would have to be felled because they aren't uh, of a quality that would need to be retained. We saw some on site today where actually they're built off existing structures uh, and those again would not meet the terms really of modern definition of what should be protected. So uh, the scheme itself does remove some trees, but uh, your officers are confident that um, the s landscaping scheme that has been proposed with the development will uh, mitigate the loss of those trees. Uh, and finally, in respect of the conservation area and um, the listed buildings beneath, um, the uh, con council's conservation officer has looked at that, this in some detail. There is a section in the report which goes through it um, in quite some detail. And the view is that it will neither affect or detrimentally affect the conservation area nor the list of buildings underneath. Um, I'd like to myself deal with a couple of issues as well on top of those that were raised uh, during the conversation. Um, the first is in respect of um, the development and Section 106 contributions. Um, members will be aware um, of from the report that uh, the development does not uh, meet the full terms of the Section 106 contributions that would normally be required for a development of this type. Um, as part of the uh, negotiations following the submission of the application, uh, the applicant has shown or has submitted what's known as a viability report, uh, which has indicated that due to the difficulty of developing the site, um, the profit level that would be necessary as part of that means that um, they cannot meet the full terms of Council's uh, section 106 agreement. They have submitted a report to us, a viability report. That report has been looked at by the, the district valuer. The council uses uh, it's either its own estates department or district valuer to try and assess those viability reports. District valuer in this case has looked at the report and has come back and agrees that uh, in terms of the development that is proposed, uh, the it would not be viable with the full terms of the section 106 requirements. This includes things like, for example, um, for 40% 40, 40 affordable housing, uh, contributions for public open space, contributions for uh, community uses. So the report does go through that in some detail um, at page, bear with me one second, page uh, 44 onwards, um, and deals also with the fact that um, education contributions also cannot be provided. So ultimately, um, following the viability work, there is an offer of £300,000 from the developer as an off-site contribution um, for affordable housing um, with, I think, an additional contribution, bear with me one second, of 20, so there we are, sorry, sorry, contribution of 270000 for affordable housing and £29,000 for uh, community facilities. Now, clearly that does, is nowhere near what would be re normally required for a scheme of this type, but members will remember um, a similar debate that occurred on the Dolphin Public House in Barry, um, on the island, and where we got, went to the extent of uh, accepting the viability report but requiring a clawback um, from the developers if their profit levels were to increase. And um, that went to appeal and unfortunately the council lost that appeal with the inspector saying that viability is a key issue 
and the, but on a development of this type in that particular case I think it was 27 flats this is obviously 30 a clawback would not be appropriate um, so it is a legitimate issue that we can't ignore that the, if a developer has proven viability um, cannot be shown where the terms of uh, the council's 106 cannot be met then we have to take that into account uh, and we have done in this case and one final point obviously the issue of ground stability has been mentioned quite a lot um, just to clarify when the original report came in from the uh, developer that was uh, a desktop survey and risk assessment um, your officers looked at that and uh, with their own, with our own engineers for, uh, who advise us on it and we advised that further works were necessary to clarify that the site was not liable to um, poor ground conditions um, limited further works were undertaken because unfortunately to get full drilling uh, works in there would mean, mean the house would have to be demolished because you can't get the machine in there to drill but they coring was undertaken with a smaller machine um, that has shown that the ground in the views of, of the engineer who submitted the report is stable that report has been assessed by the council's own engineers and they were asked the question are you satisfied that development can proceed and our own engineers have advised us yes they are satisfied of that fact um, there will be a condition on there which requires full surveys to be undertaken but those full surveys as explained by the applicant will deal largely with the type of foundations that are necessary, the type and depth of foundations that will be necessary to secure the development. Um, as I'm sure all members are aware, foundation details and that, and, and that type of construction detail are dealt with by building regulations, not by the planning system. So we would not expect those type of details to come to this meeting. OK. I did stop Councillor Roberts in his track. So can we finish off with Councillor Roberts? And then I'll take those who are itching to get in on the debate. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Interrupting my flu now. Yeah. Um, I was saying about the um, the uh, custom house buildings down on the uh, on the on the barrage. Um, there one of, there's only two buildings in Penarth that reflect this history and the existence of Penarth, and this is one of them. Alongside it is the restaurant, which I think is a fabulous example of how a beautiful restoration can not just only deliver a fabulous building, but can be commercially viable. Now, Cardiff Bay Development Corporation recognised that and sealed this building, the building that's there now. They refused a number of development uh, opportunities on the basis it had to be worthwhile. What's now happened, there is extant building uh, planning, planning um, consent for a new hotel uh, using that building. I have to say, it's subjective, but I think it's absolutely fabulous building, but I know that it's now on hold because of financial constraints in terms of viability, although there are movements that will make that more, uh, which will probably help that come along anyway. Um, but my view is that those flats, they're visually overwhelming that building, whatever it may show on, the, on this painting. Um, and what will happen, there'll be no, the viability will disappear for that building. So as far as I'm concerned, we just signed the death warrant of that building. They will never get, they will never become viable when it is overwhelmed by very large flats. Um, on page 36 of the report, the conservation officer deals with, uh, with the planning and policies and says what they all are. I won't go through all of those now, but I will refer to his comments on page 37. And I'll read them if I may. In assessing the impact on identified headed the ashes, the conservation officers concluded there will be no impact of the setting of the listing buildings or conservation area from the proposed development. Well, the conservation area will be uh, affected because it is framed by mature trees and the extra renters will take that down. That may not be big in the whole scheme of things, but elsewhere, there are very important things, and this Town 14 I referred to earlier talks about landscapes and conservation areas, and I think that's really important. But I wonder if the conservation officer has been influenced by that beautiful picture on page 26. You know, I, I absolutely love uh, pastel drawings, and that's very attractive. Um, of course, it also gives a little bit of artistic license. If I was more able with IT, I'd probably use CAD reproduction of what the proposals are but I have to say that um, if you look if and this I'm sorry I've just asked Vicky for an overlay because there was an overlay given me this morning which showed the set out of the site in relation to the marine buildings because nothing in here directly does it but if you look at that picture on page 26 it looks like it has very little impact on the uh, Penarth headland and there's very small little building above 
the right-hand building is the restaurant, very little indeed. If you then have a look at the picture directly above it, you will see that the buildings completely fill the site as shown, right to the, all the way to the right to the edge of it. If you then, I'm sorry to keep on doing this, but it's, uh, it is important. If you then go to page 23, you will see that the site completely covers the whole width of both buildings. And therefore, these flats will cover the, more than the width of both buildings, whereas that drawing shows a little tiny one above the restaurant only. Now, I'm all for artistic license, uh, but, but they say they're going to put trees there, but let's make no bones about it. These are going to be premium quality flats. Mr. Loyne is a very well-known, superb architect. That will add to their value. They will have the best view, as you saw this morning, across the whole of the bay. They are premium quality flats. The only way that could be, that drawing there could be achieved is if all trees were allowed to, be, to grow right in front of them. Now, do you think somebody moving the, the premium quality flats is going to allow us to plant trees to block the view? Of course they're not. It's never going to happen. And I have to contend that this picture is so misleading as to be a deliberate misleading um, act. It, does not, it will not look like that at all. You can look at the levels and you look at the plans and you can see that these flats totally dominate not just that bot building which signs its death warrant, but will also completely destroy the um, context of what is a very important bookend to Cardiff Bay. Now, as far, as far as I can see, the Cardiff is about the only thriving part of Wales at the moment. It's the fastest growing city in the world, and Cardiff Bay is a key to it. <coughs> this, this Panath head, after which Panath is named, bookends that bay, and, and it is the entrance to the Vale of Glamorgan. This will destroy that outlook. There's no, make no bones about it, it will destroy it. So I, I, and I have to say that I'm really disappointed that we've accepted that drawing there without question when it is so misleading that it, it, it's almost dishonest. Yeah, can the right. officer just come back on that Well, point? can I finish what I'm saying? Yeah, go on then. On. I'm yeah, sure Marcus will uh, assess it all. Yes. <laughs> I am, um, if I can turn to the section 106 monies that Marcus has referred to, I, you know, I show my lack of expertise here, but it appears that the evaluation of the lack of 12 affordable houses is about 300,000. Also, the report notes that Panath, though it may not be expected because it's a wealthy area, Panath has some of the worst housing shortage because of the expensive houses in the whole of the Vale. But they're not, they, they can't produce these 12 houses. Not surprising how much they cost to do it. So there's 300,000 there, further 300,000 for education, 30,000 for community facilities, 70,000 for public open space, 60K for sustainable transport, my guess is 50,000 for public art, and 6,000 planning costs. That totals 817,000. Now, the developer has requested exemption, and as Mark has said now, the total contribution will be 306,000. Let's not forget you, we all tend to look at Section 106 as a nice bit of bonus for the, for the community, but they are real costs, particularly education costs. And it means that we will subsidise this development to the tune of half a million pounds. Now, Marcus explained very patiently why this rule says that we can't refuse it, that we, that we have to allow them to waive it if they prove non-viability. But let's, we're a committee here, we don't have to pass it, do we? And I think that will save us half a million pounds a year. So I think that's something that's fairly important to us. I, um, I, as an aside, by the way, uh, there's a large number of uh, objections to this from, from our area, but very few from the actual Northcliffe Flats, a few people have. And I, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with this, but all those people in the flats were told they'd have a windfall of between 1,000 and 2,500 pounds if the development goes ahead by virtue of purchasing the car park. Now, I, I don't think there's anything... I'm, make it clear, I'm not saying there's anything illegal here, but there's a quarter of a million pounds goes out there. I wonder what that does to the viability of the place. Anyway, um, I, as I said, I'm not an expert. I haven't even tried to plow through the myriad planning regulations quoted, but I did look at TAN 14, and I looked at it in some detail. And I have to say, I read it, and I just cannot see how this complies with it. Page set page, I can't read it, page two, I think it is. Item number eight, key issues. Proposals of development. It depends on the nature of the coastline, but there are a number of specific issues in relation to the coastal law that the planning system should address. Proposals of development. The nature of the ground conditions and physical processes, 
and the potential need for remedial and defence works, and any potential impact from both land and sea, and I've just referred to Penarth Head. And if it then goes on, there's a, a figure three, and, and it talks about settings. The first one's rapidly eroding cliffs and actively unstable slopes. This one is. The desktop study showed it to be very, uh, I'm sorry. And it says, if development, development control, if development is considered, it should be preceded by a detailed investigation, full risk assessment, and or environmental studies. Many planning applications in these areas may have to be refused on the basis of potential physical problems. I'm sorry, Marcus, that is a little bit at odds with what you just advised us in saying it's not a planning matter. TAN 14 says it specifically is. On the lesser one of eroding cliffs, which is what I spoke to, I'm speaking about, it says where there's potentially unstable slopes, and this is much worse than that, a site reconnaissance study will need to be followed by detailed site investigation, including a risk assessment and or environmental study prior, prior to lodging a planning application. Now, all we have here is subsequently, we've asked for some more work, and they've done a little, they've done a little bit more work. And, and to quote that they couldn't do it until the lodge is demolished, the lodge, if you look at the picture, makes up probably less than 5% of the whole area here, and the lodge is probably on the most stable piece of land. The rest of the land is sloping away and breaking away. So that's not that. that none of that is affected by the lodge being there, or uh, very co comprehensive grounds that you go, go across. And all of that it says here should take place before any application, before any planning application is lodged. So I, I, I find that a little bit difficult. Not only that, but the the ground the desktop study shows a picture of a huge landslip that actually closed access to the beach back in 2014, which is either absolutely adjacent or even within this site. So there's huge fall there. And if you travel about 300 metres westward from there, where the, Harb uh, the Penarth Heights has been developed, that was also a survey that said OK. But in actual fact, I think it was last in the year before last, there was a huge fall there, which actually led to temporary evacuation of the houses on that site. You have a very unstable site here. So I, I, may I appreciate it might make it difficult in terms of Section 106, but it could well be. It makes it unviable simply in terms of its stability. So I really uh, I think that that is a problem. I, I, I'll bring us up to date now. Um, you may have seen the press over the last few, few days that ex-Cabinet Minister Mr Michael Gove has been in there. Now you may guess I'm not his greatest fan. Uh, he was referring to Brexit, and he's want to express caution about experts. And he warns, well, well not to cry in their expertise, skill or honesty, but what he refers to is groupthink. <coughs> Where all the experts start in the same place, which loses the broad perspective that far less informed or able people can still see. A bit like the Emperor's New Clothes. I said at the start how difficult I found this process, but the fact is I was not expect elected as an expert. I was elected as a lay person with the interests of my community at heart. When I look at this report, saw the desecration of a historic, iconic landscape. I immediately saw that one of the very few historical old buildings in our part of the coast would be effectively destroyed. It looks immediately, the, the development looks immediately precarious. It rips out the tree that framed the joining conservation area. Perhaps this is the broader perspective that Michael Gove was referring to. He said to me that it isn't a single reason to refuse this. I don't agree, just Tan 14 on its own is one. But these worries of mine addressed in various conditions attached. But at what point does the multiplicity of conditions become the bleeding obvious that is not a suitable development? From a holistic point of view, this development is simply wrong. It is wrong in too many aspects. And I recommend the committee does not accept the officer's recommendation, but refuse the application, apart from any other reasons, simply because it's premature in accordance with TAM 14. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you have a seconder? Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask Marcus Goldsworthy to come back, uh, first of all, because there is a... Sorry? Yeah. Could you give us the reason for refusal? You did say TAN 14, but you'll have to... Uh, certainly do something better than that. Yeah. Yeah, turn your mic on, can you, Glenn? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, in it, first of all, it is a premature application because it does not comply with Town 14 where there must be a full, uh, it, it's quoted on, on, on um, figure three on there, a, full, a site, sorry, 
It should any prevailment should be preceded by a detailed investigation, full risk assessment and or environmental study. And many planning applications will have to refuse on the basis of potential physical problems. Remember, we're not talking about actual potential physical problems. That's one reason. The second reason, any, any development should not encroach on a conservation or a natural landscape. In terms of the conservation area at the edge of is framed by mature trees. The entrance will now damage that because there'll be a third entrance there. And thirdly, and to me most importantly, it will destroy the um, context of the path headland as well as the uh, viability of the listed building that's presently being preserved. Okay. Marcus, do you want to come back on that now? Okay. I, I'll come back on some of the issues. I think you may have to ask an adjournment right. while we debate the talk about the uh, any possible reason for refusal. Um, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that in open committee, okay. so I think you will have to adjourn it, and we can perhaps have that discussion with the members of the public removed from the room. Oh, we'll have, we'll have to leave. Yeah, we'll we'll have to leave as a committee and go into committee room two. Right. Okay. That's okay. fine. Um, if I start with the issue of TAN 14, TAN 14 is a, a, a development which talks about coastal planning. Now we have to remember, firstly, that this, while this is on the coast, it isn't at risk of coastal erosion. If this is inside the marina itself, and therefore the land below it is not part of that. So you, you have to recognise our own engineers and our own co engineers who are uh, experts in this field. I know, I know obviously you don't have a high, view, a high opinion of experts, but our own coastal engineers have, have made a spot. You know, it's not in, within the marina market. It's, it is on the headland. Yeah, well, can I just come back on this point? The, our own engineers have looked at this and I've, I've been asked this very question. Have you got enough information to take a view on it? Because it's all very well us saying this, that there isn't enough information and members putting that out there. But if it goes in front of an inspector and he has asked um, who objected to this, and if our own engineers raise no objections, it is highly likely that he will not consider that as a suitable grounds for refusing it. So I would caution most strongly against using that when our own engineers have told us in this report they have enough information for a decision to be made. Um, I'm not an engineer. Um, I don't know if any of the councillors here are engineers, but certainly um, I could not advise you whether they have or they haven't, but I rely expressly on the views of the council's engineers who have advised us. So if I can just leave that there. Section 106 and viability obviously is an issue, and it is disappointing when developments come forward that don't meet the terms of our um, SPG supplementary planning guidance on, on um, Section 106. But the truth of the matter is there are a number of developments going forward that don't meet the terms, or cannot meet the terms because of development viability and site viability. And that is not a reason. Once it's been proven to us and been assessed by the district value, that is not a reason to refuse the application. We would, as, we, as happened to uh, the council on the Dolphin, come up against the sticky wicket and almost certainly lose that reason for refusal. So I, cannot, I can't support any reason for refusal which talks about Section 106. Um, I think that was the main issue we talked about. I don't know if I've missed any issues off. Oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, sorry, one issue, the final issue was the, uh, the plans or the, the, the painting that had been put in and the, and the plans. And I just wanted to go back and show you um, the actual, if this is going to work, it probably isn't now. Um, we have to recognise that plan, that painting is taken from a particular elevation. This is now frozen, I do apologise. <coughs> Um, there, is an there is a drawing I was just going to bring up which actually shows the elevation of the buildings that are proposed. And yeah, it's not very clear there, unfortunately. Um, this computer is now completely frozen. Right, that's the one I was looking for. Um, that plan there, which shows you a block to one side, um, if I use the mouse there, there's a small block there. I say small, it's a, a, there is a block there, and there is a, that, where my hand is running back and forth, that is the front block above the marine building. Um, behind that are a number of, are the, the two other ranges. Um, if you look at the, sorry, I'm going to probably have to go back on this for some reason, it won't.
the blocks we were looking at there are shown on that painting or that watercolour behind with the those there being the ones closest to the, mar the marine buildings and obviously those behind being the blocks that are set further back. There is the building we talked about and I said was separate to it. So, I, you know, obviously there are different aspects, different, um, this is taken from a particular angle or this, this, this painting is, is undertaken from a different particular angle, but I can't agree that it is uh, not accurate. So, uh, Marcus has finished speaking. I've got nothing better to say now, Chair. Yes, okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I, in terms of Section 106, that's fine. I, I, I just did it for members' information. I appreciate what Marcus said. And uh, I said in my prepared notes, Marcus is the messenger, so he won't shoot him. Uh, and so, so, 106, I didn't recommend we refuse it on the grounds of 106. I just made an observation. Um, in terms of hiding it, on page 38, the conservation officer actually says is, is no doubt most existing blocks and seeks to maximize sea views. If you go to that picture, there's only about half a dozen of the 30 flats will actually have sea views, if that's accurate. I'm sorry, that's not so. And if you look at the levels on page 26, they are not shown on that, <laughs> on that there. And I just wonder, I, and I just have to ask, why wasn't there a CAD reproduction of what the flats would look like? There are, that will not be that will not be covered by trees like that. And it's, if, I, if I was a betting man, I'd put my pension on what that says. It will never look like that because the people who buy these very expensive flats, and mark my words, they will be, nobody who buys them will allow trees to be built up to block their view. And we'd be completely unrealistic to expect it. That is not an accurate picture. Okay. Right. Um, I, I've, before I come to Councillor Hodges, I know uh, Councillor Clive Williams wanted to speak, Councillor Bird, uh, Councillor Jeff James, uh, and I think you had your hand up as well, didn't you, Councillor Barker? And then I'll come across to you. Okay. Yeah, in seconding Councillor Gwynne here, uh, I was the ward councillor here for many years when it was the old St Augustine's and Plymouth combined. Um, I, I won't go through all the detail in, uh, that Gwyn has said there, but there's a few things here. This is one of the finest sites that I've seen in the 34 years that I've been a councillor. <coughs> Gwyn mentioned El Puerto there. That custom house was actually left derelict for 20 to 30 years. Luckily, we had the sense there to do something about this. This is an iconic building now. I think it's been open 22 years. It's the second biggest employer after Tesco's. So that's earned money for this council and everything else. Now, all of that is in keeping. You now have people coming from abroad to see the barrage. I was mayor in 87, and the barrage has put Wales on an international map. Cardiff's the fastest growing city in Europe. So all of these things are there. W this council has resisted um, lots of things uh, in that area. Now, I, I think this is one of the finest sites, as I say, ever. And I don't think that this planning application is worthy of that site. That's the, the you know, that's there. And I mean, basically, um, I, I think to, to have the barrage there and all the people that are visiting and the tourism and everything, I don't think this is worthy of the site. I totally respect what the, all the planners are saying and I understand the position they're in. But if, if I had this site here, I would want to do something which would enhance Penarth and if Penarth's supposed to be one of the best places to live in uh, UK, I don't think this will add to our reputation. Anyway, thank you, Mr Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bird. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of points quickly. Again, um, my major concern on this is the Section 106. I think developers are regularly hoodwinking us now with viability issues. Um, if it's such an unviable scheme, why do they so desperately want to get planning permission on it if they're only going to make a few thousand pounds? These are going to be some of the most expensive flats in Wales. Yeah. Uh, they've got the premier view, and I'm sure another 10,000 on the price of each unit would not make a haperth worth of difference to their selling price. They're going to be very sought after, although the architecture to me looks diabolical, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, <coughs> But I, I, I really think that these viability things, uh, you know, we're being hoodwinked. And, and for them to get away with half a million pounds 
knock back on the say of a few uh, consultants. I think we're mugs if we accept that. Uh, secondly, then, the design of this building, I don't call that contemporary architecture. It looks like a 1960s um, block of masonettes, as far as I'm concerned. That is not what I'm calling good modern architecture. Uh, and I think it will be very detrimental to the classic buildings that you can see from the barrage. So I support what everything that has been said so far, and I'm sure that we can come up with some very good viable reasons to turn this down. It is not acceptable to put this in probably the <coughs> best site in the Vale of Glamorgan, yeah. if not the best site in, in Wales. In Wales. Yeah. It, everyone will be clamouring for these if they are built, although they look like carbuncles, um, just for the view. So, you know, it, it's scandalous, and, and I'll leave it there for now, but I, I just think, you know, we're being hoodwinked. Okay. Councillor James. Mr Chairman, this is an incredibly important site. Previously, one residence, which was probably sympathetic in the way that site was, was managed and was set out, it's an escarpment that's immediately above listed buildings, and therefore the context of the listed buildings is paramount. And I think that the setting of these buildings is not enhanced, and that in terms of conservation, we, we're charged with preserving or enhancing. That neither preserves nor enhances the listed buildings or the conservation area. And I think that Whilst we're debating about the fact that there's an application for 30 flats, uh, members of the planning committee are in a difficult position because we have to consider the application that's before us. Wouldn't it be good if we, we would be able to make a decision to say that we don't want 30 flats on that site and we don't have that luxury? We have to consider the application on its merits. But I, I have to say that I don't think that this scheme is sympathetic, and I don't think it preserves or enhances the, um, the conservation area or the listed building. For those reasons alone, I feel that we should not be bulldozed into accepting this development simply because it's a good design by a good architect um, and because it stacks up on all the other things that we've talked about. Surely the principle is, does it preserve, does it enhance? In my mind, it does not. Thank you. Councillor Parker. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <coughs> uh, just, just the first thing I'd like to say is if, if you turn to page 51, on the recommendations, I think it's quite likely that you admitted the planning obligation in respect of the education. Is that correct? Or does that appear elsewhere? Recommendation, subject the interest, persons first century 106, off-site contribution for affordable housing that are Surely we should have education in there as well. It's not necessary. It, is necessary. it would be necessary, but the viability comes in a different spot. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other one I was trying to, trying to establish was the, the choice of materials. Uh, I can't see a material um, condition. Can, you, can I give you a second? To it, what, what concerns me is uh, external walls White facing brick, well, quite clearly, white facing brick is not appropriate to Panaf. I don't think there are any white facing brick. There. So if it was to go forward, I would recommend a condition for the for materials. Sorry? Oh, fine, thank you, okay. Uh, okay, finished? Yeah, fine, thank you. Okay, Councillor Hodges. So, thank you, Chairman. Um, we've, we've had a bit of discussion tonight about indicative drawings and plans and layout. Um, if I can ask a question on page 25, and it's the picture there, the, uh, I'll call it a picture, uh, the one that actually got the black blocks. Uh, that looks like a scale to me along the side, which I can't read because it's so tiny. I was just wondering if, uh, if the officers could tell me the height, if that is a scale, and what it says. I know the plans say between three and four stories. So I think I've got a general idea how probably high they'll be, but I'd like to know that. Uh, I've got a point to make on the 106. Um, section 106, as I understand, is there to mitigate 
um, issues caused by the creation of something that wasn't there before. Um, and now we're being told that it has to be reduced to improve the viability because the site is difficult. If the site is difficult, don't build there. Don't build there. Go somewhere else. If you want to build there, well, the risk is with you. And don't shortchange us because this will cause issues for that area that need to be mitigated. And we are, as Gwyn has said, being shortchanged here. And I would say that uh, people who judge whether an architect is a good architect is other architects. So I am not, um, you know, I'll judge who a good architect is in my mind. And this scheme is not architecturally kind. I'll leave okay. it at that, Chairman. But I'd like to be interested to know the scale, the height of these buildings according to this, uh, this drawing here. Okay, Councillor Brooks. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, it is just another additional point that also concerns me. I, mean, I, I totally agree. The Section 106 money, that's really, really, it, it's appalling. Yeah. And they are taking us for a ride. And it seems to be cropping up. There's almost like a precedent being set, or trying to be set here. And that really concerns me. But the, my other, as, as well as agreeing with everything else that's been raised here tonight, is about the access to this site. Is that, as I understand, it's going to be coming through Paget Place. Um, which is already a narrow area. Um, and I've got a real concern there about the impact then upon residents while whilst the building's going on, and you know, if it did go ahead, and then also afterwards, because that will only be that one point of access, and that does concern me. There's already a lot of parking up in Paget Place, and it's a narrow area as it is. So I'd really, I'd like just like a, uh, whether, uh, whether Marcus could actually uh, give me some thoughts around that, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add one more consideration on the issue of how this will impact on the listed buildings. And if you look at page 25 in the report, there's a sketch diagram there that shows in profile the listed building and the slope and the location of the three blocks. Now, it's extremely difficult to imagine what this is going to be like and it frustrates the hell out of me as a committee member that we don't make or developers don't make more use of, of computer graphics in order to show more realistically what things will look like but if you imagine you were some distance away on the barrage and looking ac across this profile and you draw a line over the top of the listed building you can see that it would come to approximately the bottom of the lower block, perhaps to the top of the first floor there. The point I want to make is, from that view, which is the most important one from across the barrage and the other side of the bay, you're going to be looking at at least the first floor and the stuff on the top of the first block, and then you're going to be looking at the same for the next block and probably the two floors of the upper block so that actually the impact of that will not be a two or three floored building you'll be looking at a stepped mass that from a distance will just look like one large building and it will dominate I believe the the view of the listed building from there okay uh, councillor Bob Penrose Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> yes, it's really coming back on the Section 106. Uh, perhaps the officer can explain to me that the viability of the scheme is being put forward as a reason why, and yet when um, the person spoke in favour of the scheme, they haven't assessed yet the costs. So what figures have been given to the district valuer? Have we, they've just taken the worst scenario it could ever be, and does that mean that basically if they don't have to do the worst scenario then section 106 could be increased because the engineering costs are going to be reduced okay can you answer that marcus that specific point uh just to excuse my voice this evening as you can see i'm losing it but um just in respect to the viability because i've obviously had a bit more involvement in that side of things than marcus with the case officer the information that's submitted is on the basis of um, you know, normal assumptions in terms of this type of build. 
the district valuer uses a quantity surveyor to assess all those inf all the information submitted and assesses just like we assess the submissions on an application whether or not those are reasonable assumptions for a site like this for a build like this so they are general you're quite right if there are different um you know more expensive potentially um solutions as a result of the further ground investigations then that could potentially make the build more expensive for them but the dv assesses the viability submitted and uh, information submitted and whether or not that those are reasonable assumptions to make that's what they base their advice to us on okay is there any other member councillor franks thank you um, I won't reiterate what um, other members have said, um, although I'm uh, generally in full agreement. But I'd like a point of clarification. Um, there seemed to be a suggestion that if there's a motion to dis disapprove, that the meeting be held up and go into private session. Yes. Well, I'm not really sure how that will look to the rest of the world, <laughs> Chair, that um, we can only discuss if yeah the public, I'll if stop you there and we'll let the officer explain it to you because it is Welsh government guidelines that we have to follow well actually it's, it's more a point of um, uh, if obviously this is a, a, an open committee which people are recording in terms of the uh, cameras um, any comments that are made could be used and can be used in any future appeal against us so it would be better if it was in closed session that that was discussed and then the reason that was put, come up with for, for refusal if that was the case um, came, comes out uh, following that rather than the debate and discussions go on in open session um, in the past just to explain um, where we have had an appeal and an overturn took place um, the developer stroke agent for the developer used the comments that were made by certain councillors in the in the meeting um, to argue for costs in an appeal and succeeded in that so it is actually a legitimate reason for doing it so that we don't put the council in a difficult position uh, in the future okay point taken thank you okay uh, yes I'm trying to understand as well if we didn't have the motion uh, to refuse it, and this actually, and this came straight to us as it is at the moment, and not prejudging, if it failed, we don't have to come up with reasons then, do we, or do we? Yes. You can't refuse an application without a reason. No. They're, they're not acceptable to the officer. No, 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 no. no that, yeah. that's fine. Uh, what I'm saying, uh, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that. If, if that is the motion, I would like to discuss that with councillors before the final uh, reason is put forward, and that that reason that would that is better done at not in the actual meeting itself. That is better done. Yeah, councillor James. Chairman, I, I think it's reasonable that if members are minded to refuse this application that members take the time to consider the detail of the decision, the, the reasons for that decision. Because if we spend no time on the reasons and leave our officers go to appeal with nothing to fight with, then what we're doing is, 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 is deciding to refuse it and not giving our officers any bullets whatsoever. We've given them lots of reasons tonight. I think it's, it's very reasonable and desirable that we members indicate their, their, their intention to vote. Um, indeed, we can vote, but subject to uh, the, de the reasons for that decision being dealt with privately. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I, f I fully appreciate the importance of having good reasons to refuse it. Uh, We've only got two planning officers in this uh, room, as far as I'm aware at the moment. They're the ones who will be able to judge what proper valid planning reasons there are. I think in terms of having us all in there in a private meeting with them discussing what the valid reasons are would be more obstructive than helpful. It seems to me we should be giving the planning officers the opportunity. I think they've pretty well got the message of why we dislike it so intensely. 
I think they probably could translate those into, into planning reasons, and we should give them the opportunity to do that without us necessarily instructing them or interfering with what they're doing. Count, yeah, Can I come Marcus. back very quickly? I, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I completely, but I, you can't delegate the refusal to officers. You have to, because that's what you'd have to do. You, you need to have a reason. Now, what, the way you could either do it is um, to adjourn so that we can discuss a reason for refusal, and then you'd come back, and that could be presented by whoever wanted to refuse, whoever wanted to mo move the motion, or alternatively, to defer with a re recommendation that you have you voted on the deferral, so that a reason for refusal could come back to this committee at the next meeting. Those are the only really the two options. I, you can't defer it to me as the uh, or, or to Vicky to write a reason for refusal for you. No. Uh, is it in port, Clive? I think it's fundamentally that we must give our, op uh, our officers good reasons there because these are the people that are now going to go to the appeal and I don't want them hung out to dry with wishy-washy things. So I think that we must give good reasons there which Marcus is happy with there because when we finish here tonight, Marcus is still at the sharp end if and when an appeal came. So yes. I think we must back Marcus every, every time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I mean, what I would just thank you for that, Councillor. But it's not what I'm happy with. At, at the end of the day, it's what um, I can advise you on what I think would be um, in your interests. What, what would be good grounds? Mm. Um, my my advice to you is that I don't do that in open session, because that will or could leave the council open to some criticism Cost. or indeed to that mm. being used in any future appeal. It was much better if the meeting is adjourned and that happens during the adjournment and then you come back with a uh, reason which you will have put forward but I will have given you some advice on. Okay, Councillor Penrose. I was only going to propose, Chair, that we go for deferment while we go for reasons. I think it's better than adjourning and going into private committee, personally. Right. No, uh, I wouldn't agree with that but... Um, I, I'm happy to adjourn it now. We'll go into committee room two. We'll come back with the reasons when we fully debated for the reasons. Are members happy with that? Yeah, hold on. No, you can't take it. You haven't got a reason to defer it. So you can vote on it. Yeah. You vote. Right. Okay, if members are minded to uh, refuse this application, yeah. Uh, hold on, let me just get legal advice. Okay. Yeah, it's been seconded. There was no reason. Why we go away? Right. Right. For, I, I, I'm told by the legal officer if you retract your um, uh, reason, what you've given, uh, we'll adjourn and go away for reasons. Okay. I retract my first. I now recommend that we have a short adjournment in order that we can discuss with the officers to valid reasons for refusing this application. That that's, makes my, sense. that's my recommendation. Okay, are members happy with that? Okay, then, for the public's sake, we're going into a private session to get reasons why we refuse this, and we'll be back as soon as we can. If anybody wants to go and stretch their legs or go to the toilet, we won't start until you're all back in your seats. Okay, thank you.
Right. Thank you, thank you for that and for the short adjournment. Uh, we've been out and uh, had our discussions, and I'm going to ask the officer, after those discussions, to read through what Councillor Roberts has uh, put forward as a motion for refusal. Yeah, are you going to read it? Yeah, come on, fire away. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I move that we do not, that we refuse the officer's recommendations within the report. Uh, I have discussed the matter with the Chief Planning Officer who's now codified my reasons for doing it. I'll ask him to read those out for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. The proposed, the proposed development is considered to be contrary to the aims and policies of policy House 2, additional residential development, House 8, eight residential development criteria, ENV 27, design of new developments, all of the Vale of Glamorgan adopted unitary plan, development plan 1996 to 2011, and the advice contained within Planning Policy Wales and Technical Advice Note 12 design for the following reasons. One, it is considered that the proposed buildings are of an excessive size, massing and, and form, and fail to have regard to the context of the site, would appear as overscaled and, inc and incongruous within the street scene and within its coastal headland context, and would fail to either preserve or enhance the character of the nearby conservation area or listed buildings. Two, the development would be contrary to section 72 of the Town and Country Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 with regard to its impact on the neighboring, sorry, nearby listed buildings and conservation areas. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so that's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of refusal, please show. Well, that's unanimous. So it's unanimously refused. Okay. Uh, shall we move on? Because I know that uh, time is short. Yes, I'm going to wait till you leave the room. If members turn to page 72, uh, this has been before us before. This is United Reformed Church in Windsor Road. And I'll ask the officer to lead us through the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, members will note there are two uh, late representations. One is an email from the agent for confirming that the basement of the building is not to be used as part of the proposed office use and for storage purposes only. And the second are a number of letters of representation objecting to the proposal. Um, as we've considered this before, and given the length of the meeting, I don't intend going through this in a great deal of detail. What I intend to do is just to re-advise re you that it is for uh, 22 residential units and a 550-square-meter A2 office use. Um, the units are broken up of 11, one bed, two, two bed, and five, sorry, 11, one bed, two, two bed maisonettes, five, two, and four this doesn't make sense, apologies, reading this out again. It's 11 one-bed properties, two two-bed maisonettes, and five two and four three-bed townhouses. Now, members will recall this was deferred at the last meet, at the meeting in September to ask the applicant to consider parking proposals given the fact that no parking is proposed with this scheme. Um, and if I take you to uh, page, bear with me one second. Right. If I take you to page 101, 100, uh, page 100, this is where the um, agent came back to uh, council, came back to councillor, the council itself, with the various no options for proposed parking schemes. Um, the uh, first scheme um, which we can see on page 101 is for a uh, the creation of a parking area at the back of the site off the pavement off Romilly Road um, that was looked at and ultimately because of the removal of off street parking would provide a net benefit of four spaces um, the developer has gone away looked at that and I 
and consider that the actual additional costs necessary to create that parking area would make the scheme unviable. Um, the, or it also involves a loss of six on-street parking spaces um, and had a, neg a relatively negative Im impact upon the character of the church. So that scheme <coughs> was dismissed by the developer. The, the second scheme proposed was a decked car park at the rear of the site. Um, this is option B. This would have provided 20 parking spaces with an in and out ramp at the back off Romney Road again. Um, this has been looked at in some detail again by, and highways officers have objected to, or would have objected to this scheme on the basis that there is an, the access and egress was directly adjacent to each other and could lead to confusion and would be detrimental to highway safety. Um, it would have le led to a net gain of 14 spaces on site. Um, and of course, the other final issue is that the because of the demolition of the uh, buildings to the rear, the former um, uh, school at the rear, um, it would have meant that the scheme would be invi unviable because of the amount of construction was necessary to create the decked area. So that was that scheme was looked at. Option C is a, a simpler scheme, which is a um, I think was, talk was talked about at the last committee, which is a. Um, a staggered parking scheme along Port Kerry Road where there is the greatest width um, and that would have provided, would have resulted in the loss of a number of spaces on site but would have provided four additional car parking spaces to what would be the normal um, situation in terms of just straight parking. The downside of that from our highways colleagues point of view was it narrowed the road width of Port Kerry Road and meant the parking couldn't be undertaken on the opposite side of Port Kerry Road which, and would have actually substantially reduced parking available overall. So that's been dismissed. Um, option D was a parking scheme which involved the demolition of the buildings to the rear um, and the access of the parking scheme through the lane at the side of the building. Um, this was uh, would have provided a could have provided 24 car parking spaces, access provided by the side lane, um, and possible exit onto Cannon Street through a one-way system. Highway engineers looked at this in great detail because it was thought to be the possibly the most uh, likely option. However, they have raised objections for a number of reasons. The report deals with it here, um, not least that they. It's unacceptable to have real lane access, but I think there was there were other issues in terms of pedestrian conflicts and crossings, um, and the highways officers felt the scheme would be unlikely to achieve, uh, to receive the support of police um, because of the one, they would be, that would be needed because of the proposed one way system um, and the traffic regulation order that would be required, uh, and that finally the actual um, impact upon viability was such from the developer that it would not render the scheme, except they would not be able to provide the scheme in any event. Um, option E is a scheme which provides, provides Chevron parking <coughs> off Romilly Road, so a different area with Chevron parking. This would provide eight spaces, but, a pros but would have led, led to the loss of approximately six on the street, so would provide two additional parking spaces. Um, again, would have led to the narrowing of the road and meant that almost, almost certainly parking would be impossible on the opposite side, so overall would have had a greater impact. So we ha they, those schemes have been overall looked at and dismissed by, the, um, uh, by both on, on a combination of highways officers and in respect of viability. That viability was assessed again to make sure that there, was some, there were elements that, there were, that we weren't, the wall wasn't being pulled over our eyes, let's say, um, and that has been backed up. The report does deal with a couple of issues that were picked up with the viability in that um, in the developer's report it doesn't take account of the uh, floor space provided, the office floor space provided. But um, given that that's a relatively easy value to work out, that has been um, added in by our own valuers, looked at, and they still consider that, that would, the, the, the schemes would render the actual overall scheme inviable. Um, one other option was looked at, which was a car club, which is where the um, occupiers of the proposed flats would have to sign up to um, share a limited number of cars. Um, that has been dismissed because of the, uh, it's only been found to work on much larger schemes um, 
in London and other places, but the, basically the scheme is not big enough to, to actually allow it to work economically. So that's been dismissed. So essentially, that's, uh, the developer hasn't just dismissed the committee's, committee's comments. It's gone away. He has taken the time to look at um, the schemes here. Um, I, I'm not going to add anything else above and beyond what we talked about at the last meeting, so I'll leave it there. Okay. Uh, that being said, Mr. Lawrence Blight. Thank you. Would you like to take your seat? As you're the only speaker against Mr. Blight, you've got six minutes. Thank you, Chair. I was only told I had six minutes as I arrived, so uh, the first three minutes might sound very clear and coordinated, and the next couple of minutes I'll pick up some points that I've that we've got to make as well, yes? Okay, So Thank I'll you. be ready in a second. Okay, are we starting now? Yes, we'll okay. start now. The wraparound community strongly opposes this application. 22 homes, 37 double bedrooms, and office capacity for 144 persons with no on-site parking. We provided evidence that the likely increase in parking demand will be 42 residential vehicles and at least 25 for business use, 67 in all. We proved the developers' parking appraisals were flawed overstating capacity by at least 24 curbside spaces. South Wales Police and Highways say there is currently no spare capacity at peak times. Our photographic evidence confirms this assessment. This does not include the parking impact of various ongoing developments, which are understated in the planning report. When Wraparound met the Vale Managing Director in Planning, None of our submitted material was challenged or refuted. This is not one or two overspill spaces. It is 4267 with business use. We asked, where will this large number of extra vehicles park at peak times? No one could answer the question. TAN 18 states, greater weight should be given to the potential adverse impacts likely to result from on-street parking if the streets are unlikely to satisfactorily cope with additional residential parking pressures. And development should be refused permission where unacceptable road safety or congestion issues will probably remain. If the question of where the extra cars will park cannot be answered, then the issues will definitely remain and permission must surely be refused. We met the developer. He has no intention of providing on-site parking, as Romley Court and Romley Quarter have done, or of making any compromise whatsoever. West End traders placed in the top 10 independent shopping streets recently have now objected strongly to the URC application. The new extra spaces they've just received would be more than swallowed up by the URC proposal. With highways, we raised the 28 Windsor Road refusal, which said, the introduction of this commercial use into a primarily residential area where the resulting traffic generation and on-street parking would have an unacceptable impact on the amenity and character of the area and would be detrimental to highway safety. Since this refusal, the fundamental non-sustainable impacts have worsened Traffic flow is greater. We are more densely populated. Streets are less likely to cope. Why does this not apply even more so now to the much larger URC site only 100 metres away? The question remains unanswered. We ask it again now. Since the 8th of September, what has changed? Nothing. The application massively breaches social sustainability and TAN 18 requirements. The church could be sympathetically developed by someone who cares about our community, willing to mitigate the negative aspects and impacts. 
This is the only way to preserve the URC as a county treasure in a meaningful way for Barry, the neighbourhood and for future generations. We urge you to refuse this application, as do Barry Town Planning, Romney School Governors, High Street Traders and the over 250 households of our wraparound community. Uh, community. Stacking the policy papers high and quoting, quoting them rigorously and rigorously as if set in a church memorial stone does not in this case a good or improved local environment make. If there is no discretion used or common communal ethos, how will we who live here thrive and be assured that the right thing is done? Planning should be a collaboration, developers with the community, not an imposition of unacceptable and unsustainable consequences. The development of the URC should be achieved in conjunction with the community and address the wider social impact. It should improve our local environment in ways which the neighbourhood welcomes and admires. We urge the planning committee to take the advice of the highways department, no spare capacity at peak times, the police, on street parking is already close to capacity in the area, the Romney school governors, unanimous objection on the basis of no provision of on-site parking, the Barrytown planning committee, two unanimous objections to this overdevelopment with no on-site parking, and the hundreds of people who live in the area and who have objected. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any member who would like to ask a question in uh, clarification with what's been said? Otherwise, I'll go straight to the two local members. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to sit, take the seat? Um, right. Are you going to fight on who's going to go first? Okay, so it's... Oh, the, uh, no, uh, councillors go next. Yeah. Okay, councillor Rona Probert. Um, you don't have to approve this application in order to save this county treasure because another developer is interested in developing this site with parking. When I talk to my constituents, parking congestion is one of their top concerns. It's already a major issue in Barry, especially in this area where it is detrimental to residents and to local businesses. You might have noticed some spare parking spaces in this area, but I have driven these streets at all times of day and night, and there are never 38 parking spaces in the streets near the church 38 is the number required by our own rules. I know of an elderly man in Romilly Road who is afraid to leave his house because he is unlikely to be able to park near it when he comes back. His mobility problems mean he can't walk the further distance. The existing levels of parking congestion in this area have made him a prisoner in his own home. The governors at the primary school in Romilly Road are against the development as it stands. Parking and traffic safety issues near the school are major concerns, so much so that the governors are deeply worried that a child will be injured if the situation doesn't improve. The issue is raised regularly at PAC meetings and with the Safer Vale Partnership. Even more parking congestion will be caused by this development, clearly, and parents will struggle even more to find a suitable and safe place to park when picking up their children. Traders in the High Street shopping quarter have objected to the plans. They're already losing trade because customers regularly can't park in the area. We're supposed to be promoting the local economy, not blighting it by making parking congestion worse. We are providing extra car parking in Broad Street but it looks as though the council is paying over £700,000 to create 30 extra parking places in Broad Street for the advantage of the new residents and businesses in the URC. Welsh Government policy on parking is aimed at reducing car ownership and use in the long term, which is a goal I support. At the moment, people can't reduce car ownership because the alternative public transport isn't available. 
This is true for this site, even if it is near the train station. It's a goal we're working towards. It's not a reality today. For example, there is no bus service to the Heath Hospital after six o'clock. You could take a train and then a bus, but people choose not to do that. We have cars so we can travel quickly in safety and in comfort. The Welsh Government policy does not insist that local authorities impose developments with no parking on local residents, but says the council has to make a balanced decision taking into account residents' rights. And that is what I ask you to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Stephen Willem. Well, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a very important issue, and I'm grateful that you've given me permission to speak on this. We were all originally told that this was an imaginative use of a site, and that namely this would be a work-live scheme. But if you turn to page 114, that's gone, to be replaced by a wishy-washy condition that allows work-live or standard C3 residential. In other words, the whole ethos of this scheme has died. It's now a standard refurbishment of a church and its associated buildings. It should require parking provision. Now, last September, this committee was very generous and very fair in giving the applicant time to go away and reconsider and look for options, because it just wasn't good enough back then, to yeah. so look for options for on-site parking. All of their attempts have failed. However, a one-for-one -one provision was managed across the road on a similar church conversion. So this means, for me, that the developers haven't really tried, and they're now hoping to get away with it, or that their plans for the site are indeed an overdevelopment. The proposed section 106 for £15,730 towards off-site affordable housing is derisory. It, it seeks to replace a rather poor offer by the developers towards bus passes. The developers also tell us to implement a residence parking scheme to help offset the parking issues that they are going to be creating. This scheme is unneighbourly and indeed, as Councillor Probert said, will hinder the area's development. It is objected to by residents, the local school, and let's not forget that none of these factors have changed. It's still surrounded by three primary schools, one of which is the largest primary school in Wales, right next to it. It's objected to, therefore, by residents, the local school, the businesses, as we've heard, and Barry Town Council. And I believe that we should do the same. Amending the scheme to include parking does not make it unviable. And so I beg this committee not to be blackmailed into acceptance of an unamended application which still has no on-site parking. It was not good enough in September. It's still not good enough now. Now, committee, as I said, you've been very generous. You've given them a chance to reconsider, to come up with a worthy scheme, and I don't believe they made any attempt to do so. And on the grounds, therefore, of highway safety, parking, and sustainability, please refuse this application. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to come and sit back? No. Oh, okay then. If you want to. Uh, we've got uh, two speakers for. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise it gives you the. Um, influence of the members of the planning committee yeah okay we've got two speakers for and i'll introduce them mr john hurley and mr simon baston uh, do you know who's going to go first right okay then and um yeah <laughs> stuart straw and uh, when you start speaking the clock will start ticking three minutes each thank you Thank you, Chair. The committee report, as we've heard, provides a detailed and comprehensive assessment of the additional work that we have carried out into all possible parking options. And the report confirms it's a professional opinion of, of officers that the planning permission should still be granted for this, to secure the future of this county treasure. This is a significant historic building in Barry, 
and it's important to its setting, much like we've have, as we've heard earlier, the custom house is to the setting of Penarth. All possible options for parking have been explored, as well as Chevron parking along Port Terry Road and Romney Road. All options have been designed in full and supported by a detailed report which has assessed all planning issues and viability considerations and officers have agreed that parking is unviable and cannot be provided on site as it would, ro it would lead to highway and uh, planning uh, objections. Picking up on a couple of points that uh, uh, the, uh, have already been raised, from the contacts we have, not all traders on the high street have objected to the proposals. Some are in support of the proposals due to the additional people that will come and live in the area and actually then use the shops. This surely has to be a good thing for, for the traders on high street. The fallback position of the church is a material consideration which needs to be taken into account. The fallback position can provide in the region of 38 spaces, it would require 38 spaces to be provided, which is less than we are required by the highway officers. The comment with regard to other developers potentially developing the site. I've been a party to an email and I've just seen an email which comprises three paragraphs from a developer suggesting that they can develop the site. No detailed plans have been submitted and no detailed viability information has been submitted to support that in any way, shape or form. The site is inherently sustainable, close to a number of shops and a train station within, with, within which you can get to the centre of Cardiff within, within 20 minutes. The objections to the scheme are based only on the opinion that there are not enough opportunities for on-street on car parking. However, the committee report in front of you clearly confirms that both highway and planning officers agree that it has been demonstrated through the independent parking reports that have been submitted that there is sufficient on-street car parking capacity in the area for the proposal. We have also now demonstrated that it is not possible to provide car parking on site. The authority had previously reviewed applications in 2006 and 2008 which proposed the demolition of the church. On this basis, as this application accords with planning policy at both the national and local levels and looks to reuse the church, it should be supported. This is a distinct regeneration opportunity which will secure the future of a historic county treasure and create local jobs. Thank you for your time and we respectfully request that the application is approved in line with officers' recommendation. Thank you. Bang on time. Okay. Uh, w when you begin speaking, we'll set the clock. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening. My name is Simon Baston, the owner of DS Properties. We are a company that specialises in the conversion of complex mixed-use schemes, generally of listed type nature. Re recently, we converted the award-winning schemes at the Pump House Barry and tram sheds Cardiff. Over a period of 15 years in Barry, we've converted the YMCA, Siemens Mission, and two schemes at Paget Road. We have looked at the conversion of this scheme from many angles over a long period of time, involving many consultants, extensive consultation periods, deferment of planning, etc. Simply put, there are very few companies of our skill set around that will actually take on the risk of saving and re establishing a long-term sustainable position for the church. And we have come up with a conclusion on every level there is a certain amount of residential conversion required to ensure a meaningful conversion can take place. This is the first meaningful application to reuse the church that has been presented to the local authority. We have gone through many viability reports at all levels and we have complied with the local authority and central government requirements at all stages. At this meeting today, the local authority has once again recommended full approval. It should be noted that our company intends to provide help for housing, where young people in the local community can move into these properties with a 5% deposit. This is quite unique to this area and it will hopefully give the families the ability to their children and grandchildren to be able to live in this area. Also, we commit to a minimum four to five apprentices and there's a maximum of a 25 mile supply chain thus ensuring that all investments are retained inside Barry. Our company has an, an internal development programme that ensures apprentices can run all the way through to full site agents, live locally and we continue to monitor this scheme. Should we be successful today, please note that we still want to engage completely with local residents on an open basis with regards to the external fabrics, gardens, signages, etc. 
to ensure that we can provide the best post, post uh, solution to tonight's committee decisions. Finally, we have completed many schemes in South Wales that no developer would even look at in terms of risk, low profit levels, etc. We could go and build on a green piece of land anywhere we want to. That's the easiest thing we can ever do as a developer. But we've shown over a 20 year period throughout South Wales that we save buildings, we reuse buildings, and we give them a sustainable future. We are committed to Barry, the saving the buildings in Barry, and the heritage of Barry. And we will be here this time next year working on the buildings inside Barry. At this moment, we cannot see a sustainable future for this church anywhere outside of what we propose tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, if you remain there, uh, any member who wants a point of clarification, uh, you're entitled to ask. No? All happy? Okay, you can come back and take your seats. Uh, the next procedure is for the officers to come back on what they've heard from either the for or against and the two local members. So I'm going to ask Marcus to come back on any of the points that have been raised. Uh, I just wanted to clarify t uh, one particular issue in respect of parking. Um, the report does go through um, the issue of parking in some detail, but um, the key issue is in respect of the existing use, and you'll heard the um, agent would have mentioned this, the existing use or the existing use class the building falls within currently as a church and the parking requirement that would generate and the parking requirements the proposed uses would generate and just for clarity for members clarity um, that is set at 34 spaces for the church use or class d1 as as it's called which would could be a number of different uses as well as a church <coughs> a place of assembly as deemed in the um uh the use classes order um and the proposed uses has been, has been assessed at 38 spaces. There is a deficiency of four spaces above and beyond what's there now. Those figures have been worked out having regard to the, the site's very central location um, and proximity to railway stations, etc., and where a 30% um, uh, cut has been made to what would normally be required. We've applied that to both the church use and the um, proposed uses. So if, just for members' clarity, in terms of the planning system, the existing, if this was a cleared site, if the, the church had gone, clearly we'd be looking at it afresh. But as it stands now, where the building is there and the use could go back into that building without any planning control, we do have to have regard to the fact that that would be, that would generate a requirement for approximately 34 spaces. So other than that, I've got nothing further. Okay, it's uh, up to members now to debate it. I know John Drysdale wants to come first. Thank you, Chair. There is no argument that conversion of, of the church and the buildings for housing and for business use is highly desirable in the retention of the building. But the question is, the key question is, at what cost? Is it at any cost or is there a point at which uh, you say, well, yes, that's desirable, but actually the damage it could cause outweighs that? The argument about the need to retain a valued building and so therefore you needed to approve the application was a major argument at, at the last committee and in the report. But uh, I'd first of all just like to clarify what's possibly a misleading bit in the report. And it says, this is page 88, the alternative to conversion would be to demolish the buildings on the site which would result in the loss of an important landmark building. Now that might imply at a swift reading that the only option is to approve this particular application because it prevents demolition. Actually, I would want to emphasize that what it says is demolition is the only alternative to conversion. It's not the only alternative to this particular application. It's not the last chance for this building. We have had another expression of interest for conversion which would include parking. The report comments on this alternative developer, page 114, as not being a material consideration. I disagree, it is material because it's relevant to the argument that the desirability of retaining the building is the strongest reason for approving it. So I think the point to note is that it isn't a clinching 
factor in the balance of decision making about this application that approving this particular application is the only way to secure retention of the building. That's one key issue on the side for approving it. On the downside is the issue for refusing it and that's the harm to community amenity from congested parking. Now, there's lots of detailed information and complicated calculations in the report about parking availability and requirements. I want to try, uh, people, other people have touched on it, but I want to try and address the arguments in planning policy terms which are presented in the report. So in the report, the Highways Department identifies that weekday parking in this area is a availability is about 20 spaces, but at the weekend it's limited or none at all. It's page 77. The parking demand of the proposal is for 38 parking spaces. That's page 93. Those two figures give you the real position of parking on the streets. In other words, the generation of parking demand from this development will exceed the available spaces even during the weekdays. And that's a recipe for congestion and frustration of motorists and unsafe manoeuvring. And it's worth bearing in mind that those 38 spaces is a reduced level from the uh, estimate of 53 spaces needed because it's a, a sustainable location. Now one of the arguments in the report is that parking demand might not be so bad because the residence cars will all be away during the day and the office cars will all go away at night. But we have no idea how many residents or visitors will forego car ownership because buses and trains are handy for the area nor their particular car ownership or their travel patterns. And despite not knowing those things, the report recommends that we gamble with residents' amenity against those unknowable assumptions. Now, the highways, our highways department considers the complete absence of car park provision is acceptable for three reasons. The first is that if the building is used within its present planning permission, i.e. fallback that's been mentioned already, some estimated number of parking requirements would be needed and this offset offsets the proposed development parking needs. Secondly, it's difficult for the developer to afford provision of parking on site. And finally, that this recommendation about parking is consistent with other planning decisions. Well, I want to challenge those arguments, all three of them. On fallback, the report on the page cross pages 97 to 98 says, fallback positions must be considered and given weight. Actually, that's not correct. They must be considered, but they only have to be given due weight. That's what legislation and advice says. I would argue that we shouldn't give it much weight because you can only sensibly apply fallback where there is actually sufficient available parking capacity around the development which can absorb the deficit in, spark, in parking spaces on the development. Otherwise, it makes no sense at all. Also, the possible uses of the building under its current permission as a church would be likely to involve sporadic parking use, periodic party parking use. Say if it was a nursery, which is also mentioned, the parking demand would likely to be picking up, taking away again. Looking at the extra information we've had about options to provide parking on the site, and clearly that's not easy, but the option D that was mentioned stands out as being the most likely one worth pursuing, and that's the one where Sunday school buildings are demolished and you use the lane from Windsor Road for access and egress. Well, the Sunday school and the other buildings are actually much less significant as buildings than the church. If you look at the document on county treasures that the council produces, the text actually treats those buildings as fairly subsidiary anyway. Um, I won't do the whole quote, but 
built at the back of the church in 1900 is what it says about them. Arguably, <coughs> I think the church would actually be enhanced without the clutter of some of these other buildings around it. Now, the access and egress via the, the side lane are considered unacceptable in modern highway terms, according to the report in our highways department. It seems we can be flexible about the parking standards. We can be flexible about the costs of the council, which we won't get because we won't get Section 106 funding. And we can be flexible about the lack of amenity space for the residents of this development. I think we ought to be able to be flexible about uh, access and egress, since there must be many other spots in Barry, perhaps other areas of the Vale, with older streets and older buildings with that sort of access level. The problem of the one-way lane that's mentioned, well, actually, you could solve that with an electronic entry and access system that would mean that people couldn't come in or out except uh, one at a time. And there was a problem raised about the uh, alley gates and the rest of the lane uh, access to that. Well, actually, if you just use the lane to Windsor Road, you could move the alley gate uh, up to close off the rest of the lane that goes down to Cannon Street, and that would solve that problem. I found one very puzzling objection to option D from our highways department, and it said that the 25 parking spaces would not meet the parking standards. So they used that as an objection to option D when they're actually approving the proposal that's before us, which hasn't any on-site parking at all. Okay, the option D proposal or something like it is not before us tonight, but it does illustrate that there could be alternatives to the application which is before us. The report goes into some, again, some additional information. It reviews other planning decisions in similar areas and in this immediate area and concludes that they are consistent and they support the parking level recommended for this application. Well, I don't agree with their argument and I actually think that all of those examples could justifiably be interpreted as conclusions that this proposed development should have on-site parking. And I'll just mention a couple of reasons on that. The Barry Hotel, that's listed. It's a listed building. It's not just a county treasure like this church, which has no statutory standing. The residents of the Barry Hotel were presumed to be retired <laughs> and likely to have lower car ownership. And still, 17 parking spaces were considered by the inspector to be adequate. That's the report. Presumably, a lesser number of parking spaces would not be adequate. The Porth Kerry Methodist Church, directly opposite URC, the report comments that the parking provided on this site was not demanded or requested by the council, but it was welcomed. However, if you go to the report at the time on that application, it says, it is considered that the level of parking provision proposed is appropriate in this instance. It doesn't say surplus, it doesn't say unnecessary, it says appropriate. It's worth noting that the developer of that particular site is the alternative developer mentioned in the report. And so it suggests that that developer probably has a lot more understanding of the costs and constraints of the URC site than the report gives them credit for. The Barry Dock Conservative Club development was for 21 affordable units, but Highways Department still asked for 15 parking spaces. It did that in the report because it could readily be done since the original building was being demolished. It seems that the parking requirement for the URC can be zero simply because it's difficult for the developer to afford it and access is difficult rather than the parking requirement being based on the development's impact on the surrounding commun community. I think we're in danger of here of setting parking requirements on the basis of what a developer can offer rather than the impact on the area and the residents. 
I will propose that we refuse this application because of its complete lack of parking provision in an area of parking stress. And if approved, cars from the development will create congestion and safety issues from cars cruising the streets looking for places. And I do that against a background that this application is not the only and final opportunity to retain the church building. It's already been mentioned about TAN 18. Um, the report makes a case for justifying approval despite the parking issue, but TAN 18 planning policy does provide grounds for refusing this application. Lawrence Blight read them out earlier on. Section 4.13, where on street space is at a premium, local planning authorities could seek contributions from developers towards the implementation of on street parking controls or refuse permission for developments where despite controlled parking, unacceptable road safety or congestion issues will probably remain. And TAN 18, Section 416, local planning authorities should give greater weight to the potential adverse impacts likely to result from on-street parking when the design and layout of streets is unlikely to satisfactorily cope with additional parking pressures. And as again was mentioned um, by the local resident objecting, we do have an example at 28 Windsor Road of a commercial pro proposed development turned down on these very grounds. I move refusal. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, move from second. Yeah. Ah. Can, can you re read out your refusal reason? I can indeed. <clears throat> the proposal would generate substantial additional on-street parking in an area where demand for on-street parking already ex exceeds availability for significant periods of the day and where there is a high flow of traffic. Congestion is likely to lead to residents parking in an antisocial manner by parking inappropriately. And cars manoeuvring to seek parking will be to the detriment of highway safety and the free flow of traffic along the adopted highway network. This would have an unacceptable impact on the amenity and character of the area. Again, sorry to quote it again, but TAN 18, Section 413, advises refusal of permission for developments where on-street space is at a premium and where, despite controlled parking, unacceptable road safety or congestion issues will probably remain. The proposal would be contrary to the aims and objectives of policies ENV 27, design of new developments, and supplementary planning guidance on parking standards. The proposal fails to comply with policy House 8 II of the Vale of Glamorgan UDP. Thank you. Uh, I'll just take some advice from the officers. Do you want some time? Yeah, yeah, we'll take you, don't worry. No. Can't take anything, Clive, until the officers. Thank you. 
the guy that vibes and just goes. Okay. Oh. Shall I wait for everyone to come back? Um, can I just, I've, I've made some adaptions to uh, the reason that you have suggested, and if I, if I read that out, um, hopefully you can uh, see what I've done. Um, I'm suggesting that um, it's reworded in the following form. The proposed development, by virtue of the lack of off-street parking, and its failure to meet the Council's adopted parking standards would have an unacceptable effect on the character and amenity of the existing, neighbouring, existing and neighbouring environments by virtue of exacerbate, an exacerbation of parking problems and traffic congestion, 
contrary to policies EMV27, House 8 and TRAN 10 of the Unitary Development Act Plan, Planning Policy Wales and Technical Advice Note 18. I have not, just for clarity, I have taken out reference to highway safety given the lack of objections on those grounds from the highways officer which could lead to other implications. Is that okay? Can you turn your mic on, please? I'm, I'm happy to accept your translation into the formal language of planning policy ease. Okay. I know that uh, Councillor Clive Williams was uh, otherwise. I'm going to go to a vote unless somebody wants to. You, you want to leave it. Okay, then. Um, right. Those members who uh, we've had a, um, somebody propose this and a seconder. Uh, those in favour of refusal, please show. Well, looking at it, it's clearly carried. I take it, Councillor Franks, your... ...developer's agent... Uh, I think on spurious grounds, uh, but uh, for my own protection, uh, I, will, uh, I, I will abstain on this occasion, uh, although, he, although apparently I looked at the, um, uh, uh, an objector. Uh, 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 I, I had also spoken to the architect for the scheme earlier, but that didn't seem to, uh, to worry them. But as I don't want to end up in jail, uh, I will uh, uh, take the cautious line. Okay, wise decision. Uh, uh, okay, that, that's clearly carried. It's refused on those grounds. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm hoping that this isn't going to take a, a long time because we've got 25 minutes before the um, security close the building. Yeah. Could, it, could I ask the auditorium to leave quietly? Can you leave quietly, please? Because we are trying to get on with our meeting. There are other people here. Okay. Yeah, and quietly so we can get on with our business. I think we should hear it because they've oh, sat here yeah, all night. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've got 10 Nolbury Avenue, and I'm going to ask the officer to talk to us about the application, which is found on page 163. Marcus. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is an application for a, an extension to an existing property. Uh, the extension comprises a side extension, um, approximately 1.7 metres in width and a two-storey rear extension, um, which uh, is full house width at ground floor and um, narrower at 10.1 uh, metres width at first floor. It also includes a porch extension to the front. The plans on the screen do show the development. Um, the extension proposed to the rear is here and here, uh, being of a double roof design, and the side extension is, is here. Um, the, if you look at the report, you will note that um, the plans are shown at page 164, and also the original plans submitted by the applicant are shown at page 169. Um, the, uh, these were amended following um, some discussions between the um, planning officer and the um, applicant uh, to ensure that the impact on the neighbouring property was reduced. I should also add, before I finish, that there, there are late representations in respect of this application, um, a further objection from the neighbouring property at 8 Nobry Avenue. Thank you. Um, uh, I noticed there are some late reps as well, Mar Marcus. Did you? That's uh, okay, fine. Uh, right, uh, we've got some speakers for and against. Two speakers against are Mr. Michael Jarvis and Mrs. Barbara Jarvis. Are you here? Yeah, would you like to come and sit up in the... 
stands. Thank you. That's, um, I believe that what you're looking at is the attachment to the neighbours. Um, the neighbours submitted that as a, as a potential option. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. and Mrs. Jarvis. Um, I don't know who's going to go first. Mrs. Jarvis, thank, yeah. Uh, we're, you've got three minutes in which to speak, and then members are entitled to ask you any points of clarification. Okay, off you go. Uh, good evening. Living at number 8 Nobury Avenue, we are the neighbours most directly and most negatively affected by this planning application. The initial planning application was unanimously opposed by Penarth Town Council's planning committee on the 30th of November on grounds including overdevelopment, unneighbourliness, interruption to natural light and impact on street scene. The revised planning application has been considered by the Penarth Town Council's Chair and Vice Chair of Planning and has again been rejected on the following grounds. One, failure of modified plans to address the overbearing nature constituting a detriment to neighbours' amenity. And two, the gable wall appears overbearing in proximity to the boundary aside from construction issues. We appreciate the fact that the applicants have been prepared to modify their planning proposals. In response, we have made some constructive suggestions regarding the revised plans the applicants or their representative have submitted. However, we wish to emphasise that the suggested amendments indicated by us on the revised drawings we submitted to the Vale Planning Department do not indicate any approval or endorsement of the new submission on our part. The revised proposed extension plans submitted by the applicants remain an oppressive and overbearing development. It is completely disproportionate in scale in relation to the area of the original house. We feel it is very important to preserve the street scene in this attractive tree-lined road. The proposed Withways extension is detrimental to the pleasing street scene in Nobury Avenue which is greatly achieved through the present spacing between houses in this road. There are 24 houses in Nobury Avenue. Although many have been extended, this has predominantly been to the rear of the property and with the width of the original frontage retained. Only three houses in Nobury Avenue have been extended widthways. Of these, numbers 20 and 22 have parallel similar depth two-storey extensions. Number 11 has been extended by two storeys widthways, but only to the depth of the original house. This concept of very largely adhering to the original width of the houses and maintaining the original spacing between properties has led to the present visually pleasing streetscape scene to be retained. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Regarding the revised plan application, the side extension on both ground and first floor still constitutes an unneighbourly development. If approved, our house would be unique in Nobury Avenue and having a very large two-storey both side and rear extension in very close proximity to a house with just a small single-storey rear extension. The plan lengthy two-storey elevation, even in its slightly modified form, would appear of even greater height viewed from our perspective at number eight, as the ground level is slightly higher in that area. This would present an oppressive overbearing structure. Our dining room window faces southwards directly towards this planned extension. We will suffer a significant loss of natural light in our dining room if this substantial extension is built in such close proximity. The architect's design gives no consideration to the impact on neighbours regarding the erection of scaffolding, labour and materials necessary to build this extension. For various reasons, including health and safety factors, together with a wish to use this side area of our property, we are not prepared to allow access for the scaffolding, labour, materials, etc or any side protrusions above and beyond the boundary line. To conclude, 
the revised plan application drawings represent some improvement on the original plan application. However, our suggested amendments do not indicate any approval on our part of this revised application as our main objections as outlined are still relevant. Our preferred option for consideration is as follows. One, that number 10 be extended following the lines of the original house, maintaining the width of the original house frontage. Two, that the overall extension is smaller in scale than the current proposal. Three, that the real elevation has a hipped roof section to help lessen the loss of natural light and visual impact, which we will inevitably suffer as a result of this extension development. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for speaking in the planning committee meeting. Thank you. Um, any member want a point of clarification? No? Okay. Thank you for that. Would you like to come and sit back down? <clears throat> Okay, we've got a speaker for, and it's Mrs. Katie Smart. And would you like to come up and sit down? Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Okay, when you want to start, you've got six minutes. Uh, members then can ask any points of clarification. And then when you've sat down, I'm going to ask the officer to... Uh, pick up on any points that have been raised with yourself or with the objectors. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name's Katie Smart and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my husband and our daughters as the applicants and the owner of 10 Nobri Avenue. I was brought up in this area and I'm looking forward to raising our young children in the same neighbourhood. In good faith, and to design our home in keeping with the area, we, local, we appointed a local architect who has worked in Penarth for over 30 years and has many similar plans approved on the street and in neighbouring streets, such as number 13 Nobury Avenue, 11 and 14 Wycliffe Drive, 15 Stanton Way, and more in Holton Close and Canaan Avenue. We were really disappointed and concerned to hear that one of our neighbours had raised objections regarding our original plans for extension, as we simply want to renovate the current tired, uninhabitable and dilapidated house into a lovely family home for us to live in and our children to grow up in. It was never our intention to cause any worry or distress or to our neighbour as we intend to live here for the rest of our lives. As soon as we were aware of these concerns and in the interest of neighbourliness, we met with our architect and had the revised plans drawn up, which have been scaled down consider considerably to the extent of us losing two rooms. These, plan these are the plans before you today. To meet our neighbours' concerns in relation to the boundary, our plans have been brought in from the boundary wall, which we share with number eight, by a metre along the ground floor, making it roughly 30% narrower than what we originally proposed. And then, where the, where the extension exceeds the existing building at the rear, we have come in yet another metre at first floor level, at the cost of us losing a bedroom and losing a room on the ground floor, which is hardly minimal. This provides more than adequate space for the building works to be undertaken, footings and scaffolding, etc., and provide more than a measured three metres of space between both properties and over four metres at the first floor level to the rear, which more than satisfies the householder's best practice guidance of one metre. Not many properties on the street benefit from such space between them, as most have converted and incorporated garages which are on their boundary lines into their extensions. So the building proposed is less overbearing than ma majority of the properties in the street. I would suggest that our building would not be overbearing to the neighbour, as at the rear of our proposed extension falls short, uh, short of the rearmost building at number 8. The slope on the street is very minimal, and our house number 10 is no more overbearing than number 8 is over number 6, and number 6 on number 4, etc. Furthermore, the majority of the houses, including number 8, have garages on the right-hand boundary of their properties which, if ours was still standing, would be far closer to the window in question and would extend more than one metre longer than our proposed extension. In our street of only 24 houses, four other plans have been submitted in the last couple of months and our plans have been the only ones called into committee meeting, even though these other plans are not dissimilar and in fact result in a living space that is much larger than what we propose. With regards to the complaint that our property would not be in keeping with the street scene, I would like to note a comment from a final approved report from a property on, in the street on number 22, 
where the plans were similar to our original plan, and this property has been built up to 0.15 metres from their boundary, which acknowledges that the immediate street scene is not uniform in its appearance, and in fact, it is characterised by the detached properties of varying designs and relationships with the neighbouring properties. It then states the extensions of a similar design and sightings have been approved in neighbouring roads previously. As we are new to the planning process, we did not attend the Penarth Town Council meeting on the 30th of November as we were unaware that this was being brought before them and we were actually on holiday. As you are aware, the decision to reject our plans was based on our original design, not on the revised plans we have before you. I hope you will agree that these amended plans addressed the concerns of the Town Council along with any valid concerns from the neighbour who as far as we can see appear to have simply reassi reassigned their original objections to the secondary plans without any reconsideration or adjustment. We feel the objections to our revised plan is unreasonable and not at all proportionate to the building works and the final product we are proposing. Again, we are not a large developer, just an average family wanting to build a modest home. With regards to concern over the loss of natural light, the side window in question, which looks over our property, will still have some sufficient amount of light as our rear extension will not exceed their rear wheel window, nor will it block direct sunlight for most part of the day due to the southwesterly aspect. In addition to this room, in addition to this, the room has windows and patio doors on all aspects, and so it's not the only source of natural light. We suggest, as does the planning officer, that this places our proposal in compliance with the amenity standards and guidance regarding natural light. At this point, may I say that we agree entirely, entirely with the comments and suggestions of the planning officer and we will continue to work closely with them to ensure compliance with all aspects and conditions as we have from the outset. I'd like to end by thanking you all for allowing me to support our application and hope that you look as favourably on it as the officers of the planning department have so that we can get on with building our family home. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions of clarification? Anybody would like to raise with uh, <coughs> Katie? Yes, Councillor James. Um, thank you for the, your uh, points to the committee. Um, I'd just like clarification on the treatment of the front of the property. The, I noticed there's uh, wooden cladding to be considered. Is that consistent with the, with the street scene? There's not any property in our street scene who has the wooden cladded, but around the whole neighbouring properties, there's a, at least eight that we've counted that have, have got the same. And there's no, there's no other ones in the street that are, look um, similar to each other anyway. Everybody's unique in the street. Okay. Any other member? Okay, Katie Smart, would you like to come and sit back down? And I'll ask the officers to go through any of the points that has been raised by the objector and uh, the supporter. Thank you, Marcus. I, I haven't really got any further comments other than to reiterate the comments in the report that the officers feel the scheme is now acceptable. Okay. Councillor James. Chairman, uh, I, I've read the report thoroughly and I, I think I've listened to both those speaking for and against. Um, I would be prepared to move approval subject to the officers including in the conditions uh, reference to submitting the way in which the treatment of the, of the front is going to be dealt because I, I do feel that the cladding is not in keeping with the neighbouring property and very often it, it can be it can be jarring on a street scene where there's no other cladding and, and that was admitted by the by the applicant. Subject to that um, I'm happy to move approval Chairman. I would that move. Okay uh, yeah I think Clive called this into committee. Do you want to speak on it, Clive? Yeah, yeah if I may. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Penarth is changing drastically. Uh, there are major problems for me as, as a, a councillor, but that goes with the charity. We've got an established uh, base of older people who are living in properties which they're satisfied with, and we've got a group of residents who wish to buy and put their own stamp on these uh, with major alterations. And I can understand both these issues. Now here we've had a classic case here tonight. 
Um, the process really involved officers recommending based on qualified evaluations of the details submitted. I consider that the, the, the Panar Town Council were asked to submit comments and these comments should carry m far more weight than they do when the officers look at this because it's the opinions of the elected officers who know what, the, what they want for their area. So, so basically, that, that's my one thing there. I, I think that if we're asked to comment on from Panath and it was cross-party, then it, they must carry a lot more weight. So that, that's the only thing. The other thing, if I may, when we say page 171, other matters, party wall and land ownership um, not lying is not in the remit of this planning committee but can be pursued outside civic with civic legislation. I know from experience, even if planning permission is granted, party wall issues can be prevent working without agreement. And again, I, I'm sad that you've got two neighbours here that haven't been able to resolve that before coming to planning. Because tonight, wh whatever we make that decision, one person is going away. And, and it's always been my, my views there as a councillor to try and negotiate or mediate or whatever so that both parties could be happy. So that's all I'd like to say, Mr Chairman. Thank you. OK, I'll ask the officer to come back on Jeff James's suggestion. Uh, condition 4 proposes external finishes the development here by approved of brackets other than uh, the hardwood boarding closed brackets shall match those of the existing dwelling that could be amended to external finishes of the development hereby approved shall match those of the existing dwelling comma unless otherwise agreed in writing with the local planning authority okay M members happy can I can I take a vote on it uh, those members uh, it's been moved and seconded those members in favor of officers recommendation please show That is unanimous, except for councillor is going to abstain. Okay, thank you. Meeting is closed. Th